start um, just by maybe doing a little bit of an introduction since we have the time and we have such a small group and maybe just to let me know on what brought you here today. Um, I want to go ahead and do that. So can we start with you? Oh, hi, my name is Galinda. I'm a picker up um, uh, on the committee and yeah, that's why we're here today. Fantastic. So I'm Mary Jane and I work for the Halton District School Board and I work on a team um, where we have uh, equity and inclusive education as our mandate. Um, so I get to work with a team of five other people and uh, we have a superintendent as well for that responsibility. So, yeah. Is I'm David Bourne. I'm a treatment teacher in SOAPS. It's a treatment center for uh, uh, highly sick youth. And so I work uh, closely with that for the Alton District School Board. I'm Tanya. Um, my daughter goes to school here, actually. She just started grade 9 this year. And um, I just wanted to learn some more. I, I mean, I have the a hair Your already made your way. way. Workshop A will be starting at 10.30. It will go until 11.30 now. Please make your way to the upper level to your workshop. If the workshop of your choice is already full, kindly join another workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry you got interrupted. No, that's okay. Well, wonderful for everyone uh, to, to come out here today. And, and I know we all have, um, you know, the reasons that draw us here. So that's fantastic. So everybody, welcome. Um, Ani, Tabi Hardwick, Dishna Koss, um, Odala, Anishinaabe, Minoto Minisi, uh, Georgetown, Dongjuba, Makwadoda. So I just introduced myself in uh, Odawa. It's a, a dialect that's very similar to Ojibwe. Um, so my mom is from Shishibonang First Nation and my dad is, um, is from Toronto, a white Canadian uh, ancestry. Um, and I'm from the Bear Clan and um, what else did I say in there? Georgetown, thank you. <laughs> and I said that I was from Georgetown, Georgetown, Georgetown. So it was nice that this is in Milton today because it's uh, right in the middle. We're going to have to go all the way to the south. Hi, welcome. We're just doing a little bit of introduction. Sorry to put you on the spot, but if you want to okay. say who you are, maybe why, what drew you here today? I'm uh, Kim Graves. I'm a trustee uh, for Melton, actually. Yay. This is your, 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 uh, in, in the area that, uh, that I serve as trustee for. And uh, I have three boys who are all in elementary school. So the, the presentation that I put together today, um, it is very, very content rich um, because I, wanna, I want to really get to the heart of what truth and reconciliation, what it means. And in order to do that, so that means it was never um, when treaties were created and, um, and different nations signed those treaties or were coerced into it. There's different ways that that ended up happening. It means that they never signed on. Mm -hmm. So that land essentially is that nation's land, right? Yeah. And yeah. when you look at all reserves, they are first nations. So when we talk about trees, it's nation to nation. So, so that's important to remember. Part of them. There's people who have camps on there. Uh, where, like with Roma Con, mm -hmm. there are some First Nations where people. When I say camp, sorry, I mean like a hunting camp. Like a, yeah, like, yeah. My uncle has a hunting camp there. Is that yeah. technically his? Uh, in with Or somewhere he's, else. He said that it was never signed over. It's, no, it's it's just a portion of the one. one yeah. part of Manitou. Yes, oh, just one of the hunting camp thing. might not, not be in a different whole, area. Yeah. That's oh, okay. Yeah. Six, Six reserves, right? Uh, yeah, Shishawani, that's actually where my family is from, and, and I, I, I live there as well. Okay. Um, that's also a Manitoulin. So you have your reserve land, you know, oh, the okay. different plots of yeah. land, and then you have um, land that people live on, non non indigenous people. Oh, okay. And indigenous do live on that land as well. And they own. <laughs> and they own. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. But to understand that that is still on, on a treaty area. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Good question, though. All right. I'll continue. So before all of these treaties ended up being created, we have to understand that what 
what this area of, of North America that we know as it was referred to as Turtle Island. And Turtle Island, there were no borders, there was no, um, you know, Canada and United States. There were different nations living all over this area, and the population was in the high millions. Um, I think estimates are like 90 million, 95 million people who are living here. Come on in, you're welcome. <laughs> in again. <laughs> So some of the early treaties that were created uh, was a two-world wampum. Now this was done with the idea of traveling. So these are representing the two canoes. Okay? So they're traveling side by side. One represent the white brothers, so the people that came over, right? And the other represents the indigenous population here. And then the idea was that we would share the land, traveling side by side, but not interfering with one another. So that was the idea of the early treaties that were created. And it tells you here, the three white rows represent peace, love, and friendship. You know, things ended up changing. <laughs> so here's a map of Canada that gives you an idea of all of the different treaty areas. And we know that Nunavut is is all one territory in itself now. Uh, was it 1991? So I put this up here because I think this is really important. I get a lot of questions. And I have to tell you, there is no one easy answer here for you. But I can tell you what you shouldn't do. <laughs> That's for sure. So number one, Aboriginal. We hear this a lot. We hear it in the language of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report as well. Um, and this is something that took many, many years. But originally, this is an umbrella term, so it's lumping in all Indigenous people, First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples. So this term um, was actually created by the Canadian government in 1982 and imposed upon, right? So it's not something that we have said, we call ourselves Aboriginal. No, that's not where it came from. It came from the government. So it's not liked by many First Nations. So I would encourage you not to use this language. You will still hear it in the news. You will still read it in the media. You will still see it in textbooks. Um, but you can make that choice not to use that language. <clears throat> First Nation. So First Nations people, um, this is a common term. This is good. You can use this term even better. If you know which group you are talking about, please use that. I said that um, I'm Anishinaabe. Anishinaabe covers a huge, huge area. We're looking at from, I don't have a map of Canada up here, it's on the next one, but we are looking all the way here, across, and over to where the mountains are. Okay, That's where you'll find Anishinaabe people, common language group. Um, more specifically, I'm Odawa, um, and then you, as you notice, like Mississauga, it's Ojibwe. But we all understand each other. Um, maybe when you move a little bit more of the west, the dialect will be greatly different, and um, it, it might take a little bit more in that translation. So, there are 634 First Nations in Canada, and 50 distinct languages. Um, there used to be more, um, but when we talk about First Nations, we're talking about reserved communities here, okay? We're not talking about uh, what it used to be when you think about the Mississaugas, right? You have Mississaugas in the Ukraine, Mississaugas in Skugog. That, that would have been all just Mississaugas, right? That's, that would have been the people. Uh, Inuit. This is Inuktitut for the people. That's the literal translation. Anishinaabe translation, the people. So oh, we all, the people, <laughs> that's what we've called ourselves. So, and then as we know, a majority of the northern regions, and of course we know today, you'll find new people living um, in many different areas. Indigenous, this is the term we hear today. This is also an umbrella term mm -hmm. that locks in First Nation Inuit Métis. The, I know the government now uses indigenous in, uh, it's now, 
trying to think of Indian Affairs, uh, Indigenous Affairs of Northern Development Canada, but you notice Northern Development Canada is, is linked in with that. That's really important um, because when we look at the land and we look at that area that treaties cover, Northern Development, what's going on in those areas? <laughs> so when we think about up here, Attawapiskat, you have First Nation community, you've probably heard of in the news, right? Suicide crisis, housing crisis, water crisis, flooding, that ends up happening. What do you have next to it? A diamond mine, natural resource development. So, so that, that, the fact that that's connected um, really says a lot that, okay, we know we have Indigenous and Northern Development Canada, right? So think about what that actually means. It's not separate. But the reason that we use this today a little bit more and I think is important is the connection to the United Nations Charter on the Rights of Indigenous People. If you have that distinction and you have that connection in its use, then you are also recognizing that charter in its existence. So using that language, I think, is the most appropriate today when you are looking at an umbrella term to use. But like I said, be as specific as possible if you can. And if you aren't sure, ask. So we're going to get into a little bit more about the truth. So what is the truth and truth and reconciliation? And we won't know everything when you come out of this, but it will scratch the surface and probably pique your interest and want to learn a little bit more and ask questions. So we'll figure out why that's important to know. And remember, we're here to learn together. We're not assigning blame. This has happened. But let's look at understanding and look at um, how we can move forward. That's the reconciliation part. So what I wanted to do is kind of set things into contemporary context at the beginning for understanding why it's, it's important to know um, that truth. So you, you might have heard or not heard in the news, depending if you've just heard it on social media, because this has been a, uh, a blackout in the media, right? They're not really talking about it in the news, the Dakota Access Pipeline. But we all have had many, um, many land rights issues where we have demonstrated to fight for um, the land. And, and it's not just about the whatever indigenous group in that area, it's for everyone. Right? Because, you know, water is life. These resources are important. Grassy Narrows, this is a Northern Ontario community. Um, you might have heard in the news because of mercury poisoning that happened many years ago, <laughs> and it's still contaminated water. And there are some very serious side effects that have impacted community members, even on the developmental uh, stage um, through birth. So, and this also has to do no, you know, no clear cutting. When we talk about those treaties, remember what they mean. It's supposed to be about, you know, that relationship and protecting the land by consulting one another. And then if, if businesses, corporations make agreements with government, that consultation with First Nations also needs to happen. So people stand up for the rights and speak about it. You know, you have children, protect our land, becoming a ball, really knowing. Uh, what's important. Here's another issue. Issue, I shouldn't say that, because we're not an issue, we're people, right? <laughs> Murdered and missing Indigenous women. Um, so uh, this is actually a statistic from the RCMP. Um, yeah, all the faces on there, because I think putting an uh, actual face to, the, to um, what is happening on there really makes it more striking. Right? These are real people that this has happened to. So this is statistics from 1980 to 2012. You notice the term Aboriginal is used in here. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, once again, government language. And it's also from 2012 when it was published. Indigenous wasn't popular used yet. So there's your number, 1,017 Indigenous female victims. So how do we get to this point? And a lot of it can be traced to legacy of the policies in our history in Canada. So this is directly from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report that came out in 2015 in uh, June. So just a little bit, for over a century, the central goals of Canada's Aboriginal policy were to eliminate Aboriginal governments, ignore Aboriginal rights, 
terminate the treaties, and through a process of assimilation, cause Aboriginal peoples to cease to exist as distinct legal, social, cultural, religious, and racial entities in Canada. The establishment and operation of residential schools were a central element of this policy, which can best be described as cultural genocide, and I would argue genocide. <clears throat> and I'll show you why after. Is that statement that you just read? <coughs> what, what is that from? Like who? The first paragraph? This is from the Truth and Reconciliation Report, <coughs> the final that report. By this was created um, by Indigenous people. <coughs> and, but the government played a, heart, a huge part in that. But this is basically what the findings were. That came out of that report. When, did, when was that? Last year? Last year. The final report. June 2015. Last year. But it's been an ongoing with consultation Ten with, years. The with many of the um, commissioners. So there are multiple commissioners who were um, in charge of, of authoring that report as well. Yeah. So we like to welcome people from other countries, but we don't like yeah. to welcome them. That's exactly right. Basically, in a nutshell. So, what I put together here is kind of a timeline on that history. And, and I have here, this is actually from the 100 Years of Loss uh, resource, but I would argue that it was much more than 100 years. And this timeline just takes us through um, many of the incidents in, in our history. So 1620, this was actually the first established residential school near Quebec City. So, you know, we're not talking about at the time of Confederation when this all began. This, is, this was happening much earlier. 1831, Mohawk Indian Residential School opens in Brantford, Ontario. This is only an hour away from us. <clears throat> and it is still there, you can go visit. Um, there, sometimes there's opportunity for you to get a tour by a residential school survivor. Um, it's quite the experience, it can be very emotional, um, but important, right? It's important for you to see, and it's important that this building is still in existence. Um, it needs many repairs. They actually have a safety evidence campaign where you can donate to them. Um, and the, many different First Nations have torn down um, their residential schools because of you know what that means and what that feels like. But they decided to keep it, to have it there standing, so that it was there for history as a reminder of what's happened. <clears throat> so we have here the Gradual Symbolization Act. You can see it in the title, right? Civilization, becoming a civilized person. So, you know, right there, that language of not seeing um, a way of life as being civilized. So this is actually the residential school of Brantford down here. And this was the idea, the goal, right? <clears throat> These are staged photos, just important for you to know. This would not have been exactly what that child would have come there <laughs> looking She's like. The point across the it is. It. Yeah, it's propaganda. Right? There were many, many photos that showed before and after because you wanted to prove that what you were doing in the schools was the right thing to do and it was working. Right? Now look. Look at our Thomas More and what he looks like over here. Right? You know, having a pistol set up in his hand. It's not accurate. <laughs> it's it's horrible. But People would have been looking at this at the time and thinking, ah, oh, this is working, right? We're making civilized children here. And was there not a horrific act there, maybe in the 1900s, where a bunch of people were killed by soldiers and buried back in behind there? I've heard there's a mass grave back there. I, I don't know the don't exact know about story it? about that. Yeah, I, I just remember reading that somewhere. Yeah. Where these it's, indigenous kids were killed possible. by there, soldiers. There are lots of like, unmarked graves. Or something. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And it wouldn't have been students just from uh, like Six Nations area that would have attended the residential school in Brantford. The, uh, the idea was that if you took someone very far from their community and placed them far away, they couldn't get home, right? Because there are many, many stories of children that escaped. Um, in fact, I was visiting my, uh, my uncle and we were sitting around having a little fire at the lake and you know he's telling the story. He's like, in the winter, uh, three girls from my community, Trisha Bonney, they there was across the way, so it's the North Channel, my community's right here. 
and across the way was a residential school in Spanish, and they walked across the lake in the middle of winter to escape. They made it, and they didn't go back. That was a story I hadn't heard before, so I, it's like, you know, I know, I know what's happened, but when you hear something like that, I think that that really resonates with you. And the so, teachers were jealous. Like, who was educated? Who, who were the people delegated to educate? Um, it was churches. There were. It was mostly church run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you had you had all church denominations that were in charge. Christian denominations. So you had the Anglicans, United Church, uh, Catholic Church that were in charge of running. And then, yeah. and then you did have government officials coming yeah. as inspectors, mm -hmm. so they would come to inspect to make sure everything was, was going on. So there were only a very few cases where inspectors were realizing this is not okay. Yeah. And those inspectors now we see as um, just the, the power of their voice at that time mm -hmm. was, was really incredible because that was totally going against all policy mm -hmm. and all of the direction from the federal government. Yeah, it is important to recognize that there were people who did try to speak out, um, but others followed and thought they were doing good work. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the parents of these children, mm -hmm. they thought they were doing the right thing. No, they, they were, were not choice. sent. Yeah. Choice. They did not send by. Were not sent by choice. It was law. Oh. So it became law in 1920 that all children would attend. That's and if you did it, you could be. Just yeah, you would be put in jail, you didn't send your children. Um, and quite often, they would come and round people up. So they would come round up the children uh, at the end of the summer, collect them all, and bring them to the school. And they never saw their parents again? Some did not. Some were able to go back home during the summer. But if you think about what's happening there, like this is you're, you're going to a place where you're not loved, your culture is not valued. You're taught that it's wrong. You're taught that it, you're being shamed for it. Yeah. You're having your hair cut off. Um, your clothes are taken. Um, and your language. Your language. Yeah, no, yes, you okay. cannot speak your language. And if you want to watch a very difficult yet beautiful uh, docudrama, I guess you would call it, um, there are three residential school survivors that talk about their story in this, and then it's dramatized. Um, it is on National Film Board of Canada. It was on Netflix before, but I don't think it is anymore. Et cetera. It's, it's difficult to watch, but it's probably one of the really best, good. Yeah. most well done. It's just the one where you start with that little girl. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, I, I should have had it in the other order. But uh, just to, to show you some of the other means by which when I said genocide was happening. Um, so you had Lord Jeffrey Amherst, this is 1763. You know, in fact, Indians with sheets upon which smallpox pa patients have been lying or by any other means which may exterminate the accursed race. So this is the attitude that's coming, coming in with. Um, we don't know exactly how effective this was because how long that would live, but it's, it's the meaning behind it, I think, that is important to note. Um, this was also happening because you had people who were settling, right? It's mine. It is. So think about at what cost. You know, who is being moved out of these areas in order to make way for settlement so that we could claim land to build Canada, right? So it's really understanding every aspect of what's happening during Canada's development as a country to... Um, to what was happening to Indigenous peoples at the exact same time, right? So 1876, the Indian Act, and it's still called the Indian Act. So you know, I am designated Indian under the Indian Act. Um, and it's based on blood, blood quantum. So the Indian Act is enacted, it gives the government exclusive rights to create le legislation regarding Indians and Indian lands. So moving from, we, we were allies at one time, we helped each other at the beginning, and then becoming wards of the state, right? So now we are, um, didn't have rights under the law that were the same as um, the rest of the population, <clears throat> or I should say the rest of the British population, right. because that's important to note as well. Um, 
just want to make sure we move through as well. So traditional ceremonies in 1884 are banned. Um, you can be arrested for practicing any aspect of your spirituality. So I don't know if you're familiar with aspects, but you know that could be having um, a potlatch, so which is gift giving. It's sharing the wealth within your own community. So that would have been banned. Um, uh, having a smudge ceremony, if you're familiar with that, you would not have been allowed to do that. You could be arrested. So any part of that. So, you know, taking away that culture and that spirituality aspect. And then 1889, allegations of physical and sexual abuse emerge in a school in Manitoba. So you can't say that you didn't know that abuse was happening to children, okay? They were documented very, very early on, yet they continued. I think I had a timeline thing here. So when I talk about the, the lands, so control of Indian lands, so now we have here lands reserved in Indian. So this is this map, just a little snapshot of it. But you see all these dots? Those are now what are reserves, right? So it went from occupying and using um, the land we now call Canada to a situation where reserves or lands reserved for Indians amount to only one-tenth or 1% of Canada's land mass. And they weren't always put in the best locations. And when you think about <coughs> communities that are, that are more remote, it's difficult to access um, infrastructure, right? Today, difficult to get supplies in. Um, going from living off of the land, moving with nature, right? You're moving with the seasons, you're moving with where the animals are, you're very in tune to what is happening and then now being in one spot, right? That's a very difficult transition to make. And Tammy, yes, that also that if there were laws around you leaving the yes. trip, right? So yes. it wasn't like that's where your house was, but you could still use the land that was. You actually yeah. could leave that. Yes, there was the pass system in place. So you had to get permission from the Indian agent. So there was an Indian agent on every reserve and they governed you. Well, that's why I say you were wards. You're basically like children. That was your parent, so to speak. So you had to ask permission, and you had to get a piece of paper that said you had permission to go and, and go on your traditional hunt, right? Or to go hunting. And you had to carry that with you because if you were found off reserve, then subject to punishment, right? Um, which did happen. My grandma was in jail a lot. She said, my great grandma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you would know this, but how, because I know the roads only go so far, so how many of those, those dots that we see are, yes. are not accessible by road? Um, I couldn't tell you 100%, but I can tell you, like we're looking all over here where That's it's right. flying, yeah, maybe flying fly communities. Yeah. I worked in uh, one, uh, hard to see here, point it out, yeah, it is the same. So. I worked in the, the town side, so this is Moose Factory, and across the river is Moose and Ian. I worked there, and it was training communities. You get there by train or you get there by plane. Very expensive to get there by plane. It's cheaper to go to Europe um, than it is. It's only an hour flight from Timmins. That's the kicker. And so from there, in the winter, there's an ice road that goes up a little further north. So you, that's when you get a lot of trucking of supplies going in. Um, other than that, you, you have to take a plane. And it's, just, it's small. And like I said, it's expensive, so many people don't get out. And, and it, because of the expense, it's difficult to get supplies there at um, a cheaper cost. And, you know, vegetables, fruit, groceries are very expensive. My brother went there on a grade 8 class trip. And it was an exchange. Yeah. And uh, do they still do stuff like that? Or I'm not sure. If they, they, we, had, we hosted, we visited them, some uh, young boys from Lucy. Yeah. And it was, it was fabulous. But I wondered if that's more if it was educational or um, was it having a reverse effect on the children actually leaving the reserve or, and or I don't know. Yeah. It, no, those are good questions to wonder, and I don't think I can. Give you a different answer. It wasn't answer, really, but yeah, I wasn't really forming a question. I was just sort of wondering why we're still not doing that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, because we only do it with Europe and other countries. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I never got connected to the people that live here, and for so long, have a voice. So unless you have a teacher in that school or in that community or somebody down here who are able to connect, you're not going to be able to do those rich kind of educational right. And also, like, even educationally within schools, you, you might have a class that teaches, mm -hmm. you know, some kind of uh, indigenous studies, but to a small group of people, and it's not cross-curriculum in a way that it could be cross-curriculum, mm -hmm. you know, to looking at the lands and looking at sort of some of the issues that it currently faces and taking traditional teachings and science and, and in other areas. Learning too, though. Up north, I think, this <coughs> I'm from North Bay, yeah. right? I mean, the reserves right outside yeah. of town. Yeah. You yes. learn more up there, right? You, you're yes. at school. You're at school with these people. You know, yeah. it's yeah. totally different down here in Southern Ontario. Mm -hmm. Totally different. <laughs> I agree. <Yes. laughs> for me, from the north, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is a little bit different. But I think we're doing better. We're getting there. We're trying, and that's my role is, is mm -hmm. to get right. in <laughs> and make change. And mm -hmm. I did bring some images of some things that are happening in our schools that you can see after. You know, I'm just taking a look at yeah. Yeah, I think it also depends on your principals or on your teachers. Oh, yeah. 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 At my kids' school, they just finished an outdoor classroom and it was built with our, we have an elderly Ojibwa nice. parents, yeah. elders there, and they helped us to design our medicine wheel. So uh, they're not completely done yet, but they'll get there eventually. Yeah. So I think it's great, right. but it, it depends on the teachers yes, and the principals yes. at this point. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and it has a lot to do with our own education, our yeah. past education, because until now we, we weren't really seeing um, the embedding, not and not looking at it just from a colonial perspective, but looking at it from an indigenous perspective too. So that is starting to change. And I'm, you know, I'm hoping it goes a little faster, <laughs> but I see things as positive, and we have to look at those those positives that are. They don't need passes still, right? No, that. That went away, thank goodness. Yeah, but like I said, my great grandma, because yeah. she'd be in, the, she was in a nursing home, and her mind went back, and she'd say, "Well, I'm getting out of jail soon." And it was because oh. she, yep, yeah, because she used to get arrested for leaving um, <laughs> the community. Um, so as we move forward, so here's where you get 1920 when when it was mandatory, right? So now you get more of your roundup. So seven to 15 years, but we know that this is not uh, the case. If you were younger, you were still rounded up. In that video, the girl was four years old and didn't leave till she was 18. <clears throat> now think about the impact mm. on the home, the community, because community, it's like you were raised with all your aunts and uncles and your cousins. Your, your <laughs> Yeah, it's community, so village children being gone. <clears throat> and uh, I think about the child and how she did not have a parent, or the children that, you know, were not parented. Amendment. So soliciting funds for indigenous legal claims without permission was made illegal. So you couldn't fight to say that this is wrong, right? Because you weren't allowed to in the court system. You weren't allowed to gain legal access. You also could not go to university or college without being a franchise. A franchise means you are no longer an Indian. <clears throat> so expanded to the Inuit in 1955. And then 1960, you gained the right to vote legally. So we're finally able to vote. <laughs> That's not that long ago, when no, you really think not. about it. Uh, 1996 is when the last residential school closed. Um, I actually went to university with someone who went to that residential school, and there were still, he was still, he said he got locked in the closet for speaking his language. So it, this still happened. So I think if I was there, <laughs> my life would have been different. So this, I put this in because this was a residential school that my grandpa went to. And it's in Sault Ste. Marie. 
It's, it's such a nice school. The book's really nice. It's actually a part of Algoma University now, oh. and they do have the historical part, so it's honored as you know, looking at victims and survivors. Oh. So, so that is important. It's one of so we, there are two in Ontario, mm -hmm. um, and so you know, Brantford. And this is a map that shows all these little dots. These are the ones that were recorded of all the residential schools in Canada. And I, I put along here because, you know, like I said, 100 years of loss. But remember that date, 1620 to 1996? That's 376 years. So 376 years of impact, and I think of the intergenerational impact over that time period. And and some people will even still say, are, is it still happening today, right? Are we still imposing an education system um, that doesn't fit? <clears throat> and we also have children who are going from those remote communities once they hit high school into um, having to leave home to attend to further their education. And then um, you may be aware in Thunder Bay of the cases of the seven um, students who ended up dying, finding Finding them in the river, you know, the story we heard <laughs> all too often. So there is a, an inquiry that has gone into that. And that's very recent. So Duncan Campbell Scott. So there was, like I said, you know, there was more evidence here. So it was known in 1907 that 70% of the children were dying in some schools. And Deputy Superintendent of Indian Affairs said, this alone does not justify a change in the policy of this department, which is geared towards the final solution of our Indian problem. <laughs> like science fiction. You would think. Yeah, so <laughs> like, disgusting. What were, what were they so afraid of? They, like, oh. that's, mm. like, yeah. that's, that to me is, this is a silent war. And, mm -hmm. For what? Yeah. Land, land control. It was land. Resources. Money. Yeah. Money. The fear. So what do you do? Um, if you look, and I think that also, if you're going to take something to justify it yourself, you have to dehumanize people yes. that you're doing that to. So this is a full campaign of not even making um, um, Indigenous people um, seem human. Mm -hmm under the law, but then also culturally too. So, don't you think yeah. some of them now have gone, indigenous people have gone the other way, right? They're expecting everything now. I know they've been oppressed and they have been victimized, but I'm just thinking, like, again, from up north, they're hunting everywhere. They're killing, they're, they're netting in the lakes. They're, they're taking everything away now because they can. Yeah, I, um I don't have like the facts on, on that, so I, I can't really speak to it, but if you're speaking about people, do you think some people are using Korean rights? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Like some know people have gone that, almost really. so far the other way because they feel like it's our right yeah. loss. It's you know what I mean? Yeah, but remembering our, our natural cause, we need to take care of all the resources. Mm -hmm. So remember when I said, you know, I think it's a little bit more like genocide? So this is the actual definition of what genocide is. So what is, you know, killing members of a group, causing serious bodily or mental harm, uh, deliberately inflicting on, on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, uh, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So. Evidence, there were medical experiments, malnutrition, physical, mental, sexual abuse, removal of children to kill the Indian and the child, right? Um, deliberate exposure to TB, uh, forced sterilization, uh, kidnapping of children, uh, death, so there are more than 50,000, 50, and the 60 scoop, um, that's the adoption scoop, so after residential schools stopped, then it became the 60s scoop. So another way to take them through policy, right? Um, so it, it continued. And there are still cases where this is still happening in, in different areas. So what does this leave? What is that legacy? So we have 
you know, we hear addictions to cope with trauma, uh, post-traumatic stress, you know, some violence in the home, um, that cycle that continues, family breakdown, suicide. Um, so we talk about the deaths that happen in schools, but we don't talk about the deaths that happen after as a result of, of, of residential school and language and cultural loss. Now, the, the hope here <laughs> is that this, this wasn't everyone's experience, and it isn't everyone's experience today with, with going through the cycle of um, the violence um, addictions. And we know that language and culture is, is coming back, so the resiliency is, is very strong, and that's really important to remember. But when we look at this legacy, we think about um, those stereotypes that we hear today, right? I don't know if anyone watched the Blue Jays game last night, but I had to shut it off. I know I couldn't. I couldn't take hearing the commentary. I had to turn it off. I was really hoping, and it's very difficult to even see that they allow that uniform to exist. I know it's in the U.S. Yes. What was going on? I didn't. They're called the Cleveland Indians. Yeah, Indians. so people are wearing <laughs> the costumes and stuff. And oh, they're the stereotype of everything. Um, yeah. That Indians are just offensive in the whole. I think I missed it. I didn't have a beginning. There. Oh, yeah. Oh. I didn't skip a slide. I thought so. So I put this here, you know, thinking about what's going on today. Would we do this for anyone else? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, when you put it that way, why is it okay? It's not honoring um, Jesse Wente. If you want to hear someone speak, <laughs> um, I did include a resource section at the bottom, which has links, and um, and I will pass around a piece of paper if anyone wants any information sent to them. I can do that. There, get that paper. In. There is the broadcast room um, that does the. James games usually. Yeah, yeah well, it's American. We didn't get the rights. I uh, yes. didn't get the rights, right? So it's American. Mm -hmm. It was the it TBS broadcast. Yeah. Which is what? in the sense night. that oh. American. so the so Jerry Howarth is a gentleman who broadcasts many of the Jays games, and since 1992, yeah. he's refused to say. He he refers to team as Cleveland. Oh, okay. he refuses right. So it was um, last night. The one of the commentators, I think it was just one of them continue to refer to the team as that name, never use Cleveland. However, did you notice in the score bar at the very top, they had a picture of the Blue Jay symbol, and then instead of the symbol for yeah. the Chief Cleveland Blue team, Blue. Yeah. they had just a C. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, maybe they're not going to say the name, but this but one broadcaster said it over and over and over again. It, and I'm, I know I'm super sensitive to it, so, yeah, but it too. did sound like it was said a lot yeah, more than really. I was and I think maybe, but I don't know. I have no. I mean, that's just my. Just I'm very sensitive to it, and I recognize that our yeah. the what's going on in Canada right now yeah. around that would be different than what's going yeah. on in the states. That's right. But a grade ten Canadian history class in Peel has campaigned to have the Rogers Centre um, acknowledge the land and territory before the game when they come. So I don't know if it's going to happen. But it's still cool that they're doing that. Yeah. 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 It's getting out there. So that's what's yeah. important, right? Yeah. People are, are trying to make that change. I won't show you this right now because we don't have the time. But I did put this in the link so that if you wanted to look at it after. And what this does is it, it was made quite a few years ago. So some of the statistics are not um, you know, up to date, but it, it takes us through that history again, and it takes us through, you know, why don't you just get over it is, the, is, is what we're talking about here, and and when you look at that history, you understand, you know, and then they, they close with reconciliation now. You know, I, I would even take it a step further in that, you know, when I look at the teachings, and seeing all the virtues that exist in the traditional teachings, it's not you know getting over it or anything. It's mm -hmm. like what we learn, you know, in an age. Just to so let crisis. everybody know, it's it was in ten minutes morning. There's ten minutes. No, no, that's what that, I meant. Yeah, they, they there's can. such beauty yeah. that we can yeah. learn from. Mm -hmm. So why it matters today? So this brings us to we've learned a, a lot about the truth, but only a little bit. <laughs> Just so you know, this is an abbreviated version. <laughs> So why it matters is we all share this land. We're not responsible 
but we benefit from understanding, right? And we're what we are responsible for is our actions today. So think about what you would do. What's your role in this? And this is some of the language in the calls to action. So thinking about that impact in, in our school system. So that everyone needs to know and understand this legacy. And just so, so you're aware, this is a, just one little part of the education. Um, calls to action, but there's for the healthcare system, the justice system, so it covers all aspects of, of our institutions, basically, and um, what we need to do to make things better, because it goes runs across all of them, not just through education. So our direction, so our board of trustees, and we have a couple here, yay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sending the letter to Prime, uh, Minister Liz Sandals. Um, you, you've also taken on the calls to action for truth and reconciliation, which is fantastic. So what else? There's me. You know, I'm here. Our team is here. Lots of great teachers who are doing fantastic work. Um, we have the Ontario First Nations Métis Inuit Policy Framework. This is put out by the Ministry of Education. And in it, it does state, all students in Ontario will have knowledge and appreciation of contemporary and traditional First Nation Métis and Inuit traditions, cultures, and perspectives. And it's really important that contemporary is in here, because it's not just living in the past, right? It's about living today. And Tammy, just the yep. acronym BAP, oh, every yes. single school board in Ontario has to have a board action plan for how they're meeting the requirements set out in the uh, policy framework. So we do, we have a plan in place on how we, we try to create this work within our school board. Oh, and I put, we are, we are also a part of an Indigenous Education Advisory Committee, and that's also something that we need to do, but we've already been doing it for a few years, where we, uh, we have representatives from the community, from uh, Halton Catholic and Halton District School Board, knowledge keepers, and other indigenous groups, so they help direct the work that we do, which is important. So, another part of the TRC report. So, problems over the years, the lack of historical knowledge has serious consequences for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people, and for Canada as a whole. It reinforces racist attitudes and fuels civic distress between Aboriginal peoples and other Canadians. History plays an important role in reconciliation. To build for the future, Canadians must look to and learn from the past. I'm sorry, TRC report, who issued that? Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I have a link to it, and um, there's a whole website. You can actually go in and you hear there's survivor stories that are on there, and there's other resources that you can access, and you can actually read the report, and you can read the calls to action as well. Remember that quote at the very beginning yeah. when you were saying where did that come yeah, from? Yeah, yeah. That's the TRC. Oh. Yeah. 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 So something for you to think about beyond today, what will you do? As the parent involvement committee, you know, where will you take this? Will you take this back to your schools? Will you take this to your communities, to your home, to your family, friends? You know, that's all something that you can do towards reconciliation. So what is it that um, is being asked of the people like myself who didn't know. Um, you're just asking that this knowledge be given to our children and that they know, but just to, to stop the, you know, the, as you said, the categorization and the, the mis- uh, that you didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. um, but what, how is this going to help? Um, because we, you know, we see that the reserves now are in trouble. Mm -hmm. And what is it that is being asked of us to help them bring them out of trouble? Like, is there something pinpointing that we can do today besides, like, I mean, I'm definitely going to tell my dog. Um, and I've learned a lot and I'm going to read up more. Mm -hmm. but. Is there something that we can start doing today that will help? I think one of the most important things you can do is to ask your local communities. Mm -hmm. um, it's important for us not to impose 
because we can't go in mm -hmm. as the people that are saving, right? But we have to ask and we have to start the conversations. Well, that, yeah, that's and, okay. So it's community-based. Yeah. That's um, right. You ask what you can do in your community. Yeah. And it's also, like you said, you're going to make sure that you're going to, going to read more and you're going to help your daughter, right, to understand more and learn together. And and I think that's that will have the biggest impact because to, for too long, um, people, you know, we don't, oh, they're, they're on the side, right? We don't look at people on reserves and turn a blind eye. We don't want to know about what's happening. But now it's coming to the forefront because of what's happening here in TRC. And the more people know, the more people understand, the more inclined you are to take action because you know it's not just. And I think also just understanding the way that Tammy has set this all up is that knowing that there's legislation that supports status quo. So asking our elected officials what they're going to do. Um, as, as the youth grow and they become our leaders, they'll make different decisions, we hope. So the power really is in youth, but we still, as a, like a, I'm in the same boat as you, um, uh, what can I do at this stage in my life? So I think asking our elected officials for um, a response to what, how, what's going on in, a, in very local um, situations, like some reserves that are in Ontario, mm -hmm. what is being done to correct that, and, um, and what laws and legislations um, we can attack and address. The omnibus bill already, the fact that we're getting away from having omnibus, omnibus bills, is a big piece that would be helpful because yeah. in one of those massive bills you can throw a thousand things in there and things get lost and it's not obvious to you and I mm -hmm. what we just have now a law yeah. and that 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 really continues this the current situation so keep pressuring <laughs> but I think, keep asking yeah like what you said Tammy each yep. reserve has their own uh, needs and wants and desires and yes. so it's very important to not do it on the kind of <laughs> thing and try and yeah. help because right. um, some reserves really don't need the help they just need the recognition yeah. that this has started. happened and that's right and thinking about it's all that's happened in communities and some communities are, are very like there's damage that's been done so there's it's so knowing, knowing the people before, yeah, jumping in. In the okay. year CK that you, the Native Arts class, would that encompass some of the teachings of this, or would that yeah. strictly be Native Arts? It, there is more of a focus on the arts, but um, there should be some teachings that do come along with it. Um, I think with the uh, English class, you get a lot more historical background than you know, Tammy, there's one other thing we can do, and that's to listen. So, for example, you know, one of the, when I look at the crisis of what's going on with the greenhouse effect in the earth, and then I look at the activism that's taking place in various parts of North America, I can tie that in with the kids that I teach in the civics class. I think we learn about shut down the pipeline and cargo fuels and not, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so listening to what they're saying about the land becomes a very, very important teaching in other areas of curriculum, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome.